Hi, my name is Ruth Fong, and I'm currently a PhD student at Oxford working with Andrea Vidaldi. Um, I hope wherever you are in the world uh, that you're doing all right in these extraordinary times. Um, and I'd like to thank Bo Lei Zhao for organizing this tutorial and inviting me to give this talk. Today I'll be discussing some of our work on understanding deep neural networks. For some background, in the past decade, there have been a number of exciting developments in AI fueled by deep learning. These range from examples in medical imaging, where some work from my lab now has been able to diagnose spinal abnormalities from fMRI scans, to work in natural language processing on automatically translating and transcribing documents. Um, to probably what's most popularly known, um, self-driving cars, which promises safer roads and more energy efficient vehicles. However, as deep learning is applied to increasingly high impact applications, the impact of its failures also increase. Thus, there's a great need for tools to help us understand what these algorithms are doing. Given the complexity of deep neural networks, most researchers and practitioners treat them like black boxes. Interpretability tools would help us develop trust in these automated systems, as well as help us understand their failure modes. For instance, if there's a medical misdiagnosis or a car crash, such tools could be an explanation, such tools could provide an explanation and suggest a fix for the failure. We'd also want to ensure that protective features such as race or gender aren't being used to make decisions. In the case of early machine translation work, researchers quickly noted that the learned representations reflected the biases that naturally occur in human data. For instance, doctor became a gendered concept that was more closely aligned with male pronouns. Before diving into the more nitty gritties of our talk, I'll first give a brief primer on supervised deep learning. Currently, most successes in AI come from supervised learning, which is a setup in which inputs X and annotated Y are provided and a model learns to predict Y from inputs X. In image recognition, the dominant object class is predicted from the image. So in this example, an image of this dog would be presented to a classifier and the classifier would need to correctly predict that this is a sheep dog. Currently, um, in deep learning, the model here represented as the function f of x is a deep neural network that's built up of many layers with weights connecting one layer to the next. An update rule is used to update the weights to improve the network's predictions. When network weights are randomly initialized, its initial predictions are poor. In this case, the probability distribution over all potential classes is uniform. However, as the network weights are updated by applying the update rule over many subsets of the data set, its predictions get better and better. This deep learning setup can be broken down into three co components that roughly align with the three research themes I'll be talking about in this talk. The first focuses on the inputs and outputs of the model and asks, what is the model looking at? That is, what part of the input is responsible for the model's output decision? The second focuses on the internal representation of model and asks, what and how does a model encode information, such as semantic concepts? This is roughly analogous to work neuroscientists do to understand how the mammalian brain works. The third focuses on the training procedure and asks, how can we improve the interpretability of our models so that they're less opaque? Can we use insights from the first two research themes to identify and fix mistakes in models? In this talk, I'll focus primarily on our work in the first two research themes. In particular, I'll do a deep dive on the first theme, and then we'll give a brief teaser of current and future worker work on the, on the third problem. So now let's zoom in on that first research theme that asks the question, what is a model looking at? To motivate this, let me tell you a story about a German horse named Hans in the 1900s. This horse was considered a math whiz because it was able to answer arithmetic questions by tapping out the answers to questions. However, it wasn't actually computing mathematical calculations, rather it was reading its trainer's body language, which revealed when it was close to the answer. Similarly, we want to ensure that deep networks aren't relying on some cheating signal such that they perform well on the training data set, but can't generalize to real world situations that lack that signal. 
We want to ensure that they are learning the right relationship between inputs and outputs and not spurious correlations. One great example of this is in an early object detection data set known as Pascal. Here, many of the horse images contain a watermark much like this one. Recent work showed that when you remove that watermark, the image is no longer classified as a horse. They also took an image that clearly did not contain a horse and added a watermark to it, which, is, which was now classified as containing a horse. This seemingly silly example touches on one of the biggest issues in computer vision today, and that is the existence of biased data sets, which I'll briefly describe now. Take, for instance, the most popular data set, ImageNet, which contains millions of images of common objects, plants, and animals, which has fueled the deep learning revolution in the past decade. Recent work has shown um, that most of the images collected for this data set were biased and were collected in North America, or more broadly, what's known as the Western world. They showed that when classifiers trained on ImageNet were shown images from other locales, they didn't perform as well. Another recent work showed that face data sets are also similarly biased um, towards either lighter skin faces or male ones. This is somewhat unsurprising given the global distribution of light versus dark faces and the likely persistent geographic bias in most of our computer vision data collection processes. In this work, the authors collected a novel data set from profiles of parliament members around the world that was balanced particularly for skin tone and gender and showed that a number of commercial face analysis systems varied in their performance on these two factors and were particularly bad for predicting features of women of color, at times performing nearly as bad as random guessing. In part due to this work, recently, IBM, Amazon, and Microsoft have pulled have announced that they're pulling or pausing the use of their face analysis software in certain contexts. To learn more about this, consider checking out a recent documentary called Coded Bias that sheds light on this issue. With this motivation in mind, I'll now introduce some of our work on understanding where a classifier is looking in an image. This research problem is formally known as the attribution problem and is concerned with finding what parts of the input are responsible for a model's decision. Take, for instance, this image recognition network which successfully tells us that this image contains a doctor. However, we don't know if this network is recognizing the doctor from the presence of a stethoscope or white coat, or if instead it's basing its decision on protected features such as the race and gender of the doctor encoded in his face. Thus, attribution is useful for understanding and diagnosing the behavior of deep neural networks. One approach to this problem combines network activations and gradients that have been propagated through a network to generate an attribution heat map. These methods are fast to compute, as they only require one forward and backward pass. However, their meaning is difficult to interpret because of their heuristic nature. What does it mean when a heat map highlights a region? In the gradient method, the gradient of the network's desired output is back propagated to the input image and processed and visualized. In another popular example called GradCam, the activations and gradients at a late layer in the network are combined to produce a heat map. Because the visualization combines information at an intermediate part of the network, it's unclear that the regions highlighted are actually the regions of the input that are important for the model's prediction. In contrast, we argue that perturbation-based methods are more principled as they summarize the effects that changing or perturbing the input has on the predicted output. The occlusion method slides a fixed size occlusion over the input and summarizes the changes on the predicted output. Similarly, the RISE technique randomly drops out multiple fixed-sized occlusions and summarizes the effects of multiple input regions being removed. Such methods have a clear meaning as they're rooted in an actual edit to the image. However, they only test a very small set of all possible occlusions. Ideally, we'd like a method that allows us to automatically test a wide range of freeform occlusions. For instance, in this chocolate sauce example, you might want to test and see if the jar containing chocolate sauce is what's important for classification, or if it's the spoon bill, or maybe even the spoon handle. Motivated by this setup, 
In 2017, we introduced a method called meaningful perturbation, in which we learn a minimal mask N that's used to perturb an input image X in such a way to maximally affect the network's output. By learning the best explanation mask, our method is able to consider a wide range of possible, possible sizes and shapes. In this example, we see that our method learns a mask that successfully blurs out the flute, causing a drop in the network's prediction for the presence of a flute. We learn a mask with the smallest area because it's a succinct, interpretable summary of the network's behavior. Without this constraint, we could learn a mask that blurs out the whole image, but this would be uninformative as we're really interested in knowing what are the essential parts of an image. Last year, we revisited our original method and introduced several technical innovations to improve our method's stability and sensitivity. The main novelty lied in learning fixed size masks with different area budgets. This allows us to more scientifically study the relative importance of several image regions. In this mouse trap example, we noticed that the spring is most important, followed by the mouse's nose, and then more of the mouse's body and the mouse trap. Concurrent work also included an area constraint mechanism and was presented at the same time as ours. Here are a few of our key findings. First, we demonstrate qualitatively the power of our perturbation-based method to test different image regions. When the spoon is highlighted by our explanation mask in the last column, there's a clear meaning. It means that when you perturb the spoon, it will maximally affect the network's prediction for chocolate sauce. We can then test our explanation, and we see that indeed, the spoon is more salient than the jar. When we blur out the jar, the prediction confidence halves, but however, when we blur out the spoon, we see that the prediction for chocolate sauce is reduced to just 1%. This example highlights the grounded interpretability of perturbation-based methods. Here are a few examples comparing our latest method with some other techniques. Because our masks are binary and smooth, they're easy to interpret. The ease of interpretability coupled with learning masks of different sizes allows us to notice a few trends. For instance, we notice that foreground evidence is often sufficient for prediction. Here we plot the class, the class specific response of VGG16 in the green bar against the percent of the area preserved. In this manner, we can check what fraction of the input image is actually used by the network to form its output score. In this example, 30% of the area is nearly enough. Our method selects the ostrich bits as expected, and the background doesn't seem to be required. Here's another example. Note that the network has been trained for classification and not for image segmentation. For large objects, our method clearly shows that the network only needs to spot a few key details. For instance, in this example, we only need to see the monkey's face to max out the output. The rest of the body is not required. In another example, we only need to see half of the dog's face to max out the response. We also observe that multiple objects tend to contribute cumulatively to the score. You can see this here as the spiders are added one at a time to the image. The response grows monotonically, but not quite linearly. The effect is similar for these two birds here. Finally, it is interesting to note that these networks are very sensitive to small objects, such as the goldfish. In fact, by blurring the background, we can actually dramatically boost the score. Looking at just 10% of the net, just looking at just 10% of the image makes this network response, which is capped here, grow past even double compared to seeing the whole image. Here's a similar example where we see a small lizard. And 5% of the area. Uh, here we see a similar example with a small lizard, where only 5% of the area is needed to return a score greater than the original one. An interesting discovery that we found is that our method generates very visually distinct masks on natural images versus adversarial images. An adversarial image is an image that's been maliciously doctored by adding a small amount of imperceptible noise in order for the image to be misclassified. In this example, this trombone image has been doctored so that it's misclassified now as a padlock. Here, masks are learned on the natural clean image and on the adversarial image. And you can tell they're quite visually different. With this in mind, we trained separate networks that take as input heat maps and are tasked to predict whether the heat map was generated on a real image or on an adversarial one. We see that the models trained on our method were clearly able to distinguish between the two. 
This provides a pathway for defending against adversarial examples. Furthermore, when we apply the mask learned on the adversarial image, we can often recover the original label around 90% of the time. That's because the mask on the adversarial image is suppressing likely the adversarial artifacts, allowing the features from the original label and original content to resurface. To our knowledge, this is the first work that suggests a post hoc method to defend any model against adversarial attacks. This is in contrast to most defenses that involve the special paradigm that requires training with adversarial examples. Now I'll briefly dive into a few of the technical ch challenges and details um, that we faced in order to make this work. We learn our explanation mask via optimization by applying the masking operator M to an image X and evaluating the response of the network phi. We then seek to minimize the response with respect to the choice of M. In the naive formulation of our method, adversarial artifacts were easily learned. Instead of learning to properly delete evidence for a prediction, the learn mask added distracting adversarial evidence. To mitigate this effect, we added several regularization techniques, such as jittering the mask, upsampling the mask from a low resolution parameterization, and adding a smoothness constraint. However, this led to needing to tune more hyperparameters into a trade-off between the attribution quality and regularization terms. In the naive formulation, the trade-off is between the area of the mask and the effect the mask has on the network's prediction. This past year, we revisited the problem and improved our method in several ways. To find an extremal perturbation, we learn a mask that perturbs an input and is then fed into a network. And we want that learned mask to one, maximally excite the network, and two, be subject to a hard area constraint. Optimizing such a area constraint is challenging. Thus, we reformulate it as a novel rank-based loss. To do this, we vectorize and sort our mask and then compute the L2 distance between the actual and target distribution of the sorted mask values. Here we optimize for a mask with 20% of pixels on. In addition to desiring masks of fixed areas, we also want smooth naturalistic masks. Consider this toy example of a one-dimensional binary mask. To smooth it, we'd first consider convolving it with a Gaussian kernel. However, notice how this weakens the signal of the mask pixels that originally were equal to one. To solve this issue, we introduce the max convolution operator, which has the nice property of preserving pixels equal to one. Finally, to improve gradients through the max function, we introduce a smooth version of it, which uses a smooth max function. Here we show how a binary mask is transformed by Gaussian and max convolution smoothing. Notice how the on pixel intensities are preserved by the max convolution. Here are a few examples comparing our new method on the top with our prior work on the bottom that demonstrate our improved stability and sensitivity. Here, our new method is able to localize the snake, while the old method yields an unstable mask. The same is true for the sprite card example. Lastly, we're now able to capture multiple object instances like these two tripods. tripods. Our previous method could only capture a single component. Zooming out from our work, I want to touch briefly on a few trends that we, along with others in the interpretability community, have noticed concerning the evaluation and use of attribution heat maps. First, we notice that attribution heat maps are most often used to show that a model is performing as expected, that is, that the model is highlighting the right areas, the right things. This is probably in due part to one of the early metrics used to evaluate heat maps which evaluated their performance on weak localization tests, such as this one called the pointing game. In this metric, the pointing game tests whether the maximal point in a heat map is on the object of entrance. For instance, is this point on the elephant or the bench, or are we able to point to the person or the surfboard using the heat maps? Recall the watermark example. If we applied a perfect attribution method to that example, it would not perform well on this task as it would highlight the watermark instead of the horse. This shows that it's not enough to just desire heat maps to localize the objects of interest. What we really want to understand is when does it make mistakes? And often those mistakes aren't going to be reflected well on performance on weak localization. 
earlier work from our lab suggests that some methods did not yield substantially different heat maps when explaining different output classes. For example, this top row shows visualizations explaining a dog prediction, and the bottom rows shows explanations explaining the cat prediction. And you can see for that, for most of these, the visualizations look almost identical. In our CVPR 2020 paper, we introduced a novel way to improve the class sensitivity of any propagation-based method. Similarly, recent work has also shown that several methods were not sensitive to the model parameters of the model being explained. In this experiment, the authors successively randomized model weights from the end of the network to the beginning and showed that for a few techniques, the visualizations did not substantially change. Taking both of these examples, we noticed that some heat maps tend to be visually appealing, such as uh, some of the ones shown here, but they seem to characterize the content in the image rather than really explaining the prediction of the specific output class or even the model parameters. Thus, I suggest two main takeaways from this type of work. The first is for researchers interested in working in this area. And that's the critically designed attribution methods and evaluations to really test that they are indeed characterizing the model's behavior. There have been a few recent works on the evaluation front that are exciting. And the second is for machine learning practitioners. And that's to assume that models have failures and to use these heat map methods to understand those failures, not simply to suggest that a model is behaving correctly. Finally, in collaboration with Facebook Research, we released the Torch Ray Library, which is focused on empowering other researchers and practitioners to easily use and compare interpretability tools by us and others. In this initial release, we focused on attribution methods. And what we were really motivated by was being able to support reproducible research. Next, I'll highlight three of our works on understanding the internal representation of deep neural networks. While our prior work on attribution focused on producing example-specific explanations, they treated the model like a black box. That is, we only focused on the inputs and outputs. In this research theme, we focus on understanding the inner workings of the model. There's a few motivations for this line of work. One is a scientific curiosity, similar to neuroscientists as they study different kinds of biological specimens. The second is more practitioner facing. We want to understand the representations in order to know when are the representations not really reflecting the characteristics that we want a model to learn. Um, and lastly, another more uh, practitioner facing reason is if we want to be able to persuade someone to trust the model, we might want to produce an explanation to convey trust. To look at the intermediate parts of a network, consider cutting a network somewhere in the middle. Then the first part of that network would produce an intermediate output. For models that take images as inputs, this intermediate output is a 3D volume, known as an activation tensor. There's two main ways of viewing intermediate activations. The first is spatially, and this corresponds to different patches in the original image. And the second is by viewing them as channels, where every channel corresponds to a highly processed version of an image. This is somewhat analogous to um, the human visual cortex and the different neurons characterizing different kinds of features that we see. In the past few years, many CNN visualizations have been introduced to visualize a single channel and are suggestive of highly selective hidden units, such as a lighthouse or wheel unit. In our work, we primarily consider how groups of channels work together to encode this information. This is similar to how neuroscientists often don't just study a single neuron in the brain, but rather coordinated collections or populations of neurons. First, we extended our extremal perturbation works to understand channels and in intermediate activations. Here, we focus on understanding what groups of channels are responsible for a model's decision. Recall our original setup for spatial attribution. For channel attribution, we cut a network in half, 
and then perturb the intermediate activations with a binary vector that effectively drops out whole channels. Like before, we use a rank-based area constraint to encourage the mass to have a certain area, where here area denotes the number of channels preserved. We can then visually diff the channel perturbations using feature inversion. Here, an input image is learned to match the statistics of the original activations, while another image is learned to match the perturbed activations. Now we can see that the person is deleted from the perturbed activations while the dog features are accentuated. By attributing groups of channels, we're able to identify how many channels are needed to encode an image. In this case, only 10 channels are needed to encode the dog. And we can also visualize what this group of channels is doing. In addition to understanding instance-specific explanations for what channels are important for a model's decision, we also studied how semantic concepts are encoded in intermediate activations. We, along with others, have observed a complicated picture where a single filter can sometimes encode multiple concepts, such as stripes or dog faces, and a single concept can be encoded by multiple filters. We call this the filter concept overlap. It's also been noted um, by others in our field. Um, and is also known as uh, the packing phenomenon, where one filter might be packed with multiple concepts, and one concept might be might be encoded using multiple filters. We introduced a paradigm that allows us to learn concept vectors to describe how a semantic concept is encoding across channels in a neural network layer. Barring inspiration from neuroscience, our paradigm involves probing a network with a concept data set to perform a new task using a set of channel activations as input. When we introduced this work, there are a few other concurrent works that use similar methodology. Now for a few quick results. We first discovered that multiple concepts can be packed into a single filter. In this example, this COM5 unit is highly selective for different kinds of animals. This visualization also highlights the limitations of our annotated labels, where perhaps this unit is truly selective for the unlabeled concept farm animal. Second, we demonstrate how our paradigm allows us to quantify how many filters are needed to encode a single concept. We try using a different number of filters for a given task. Here, we see that performance saturates when using 64 filters for airplane and eight filters for a person. This suggests that the airplane concept is encoded in a more distributed way. This was also done in prior work. In addition to being able to better understand the filter concept overlap, we're also able to compare the representations between different kinds of models. One comparison we make is between the type of training signal we provide to a model. Thus far, we focus on supervised learning, which is learning that predicts human annotated labels from images. However, the setting often requires expensive annotations and seems at odds with how humans learn with relatively sparser feedback. Recently, researchers have been exploring a self-supervised learning paradigm, which doesn't require human annotations. Instead, it defines tasks that learn to predict properties in the unlabeled data itself, such as predicting how to colorize an image. In this setting, we're able to generate the labels for free. We found that self-supervised networks benefited more from using all filters than fully supervised networks, suggesting that they encode semantic concepts in a more distributed way. This suggests, that, this suggests a potential explanation as to why there's still performance gap between self-supervised and supervised models, because their concept representation is simply not as compact. Lastly, we can view our learned concept weights as networked aligned concept embeddings, where each dimension is aligned to a filter. To our knowledge, our work is the first of this kind and allows us to do things like vector arithmetic and network activation space without input from a textual modality. Here are a few examples. In the first example, we take the grass concept vector and add the blue concept vector to it and then subtract the green one. And the resulting vector is closest to the sky vector. Similarly, when we take the tree vector and subtract the wood vector from it, we get a vector that's close to the plant one. And lastly, when we take the person vector and subtract the torso one, we get a result that's closest to the foot vector. This shows that 
the relationships between a network's understanding of concepts is actually quite semantic and makes sense. We can also use our method to compare different representations in concept space, including non-neural non network representations. We're able to do this by taking all the concept vectors and then computing similarity scores between them. And then we're able to construct a similarity matrix for every model. Then we're able to compute similarities between those similarity matrices to understand how similar or different different kinds of models are encoding concepts. This allows us to move beyond the realm of comparing deep learning models to other models such as WordNet and even theoretically the mammalian brain. Now I'll quickly describe a few details. We use the concept data set to provide rich pixel and image level annotations for over 1,000 semantic concepts. We then probed our networks with concept images and saved their intermediate activations. For each concept, we learned a linear model that weighted activations to do segmentation and classification. In this example, we extract intermediate activations of all dog images, thresholded them so that we only keep the extreme activations, and learned to linearly combine them to produce upsampled segmentation masks. These learned weights that were used to linearly combine activations then form the concept vector, in this case, the dog one. We can also do this for subsets of filters, like the top four filters, which are selected based on the magnitude of the values from the original concept vector. This paradigm was used in prior work as well. Finally, we unify our work with previous work focused on single filters by computing segmentation masks using single filters and choosing the best filter over all training examples. In this case, filter 169 was the best filter for segmenting the dog. The classification task follows similarly, except that thresholding is replaced with global average pooling, which averages all the activations in a single channel, and a bias term is also learned. We do the same filter subset experiments as well. Finally, we're currently working on an interactive visualization tool that allows us to easily explore the representation of intermediate activations. Intermediate visualizations like ours empower practitioners and researchers alike to easily understand model behavior using natural interfaces. They also set the stage for collecting annotations that could be used to fix models downstream. Now I'll jump to a quick live demo. Here is our simple tool known as the interactive similarity overlays. As we hover over different image patches highlighted in yellow, we see how similar or different other image patches are. And we can notice a few interesting things. First, we highlight the background. We notice that the background in other images also is highlighted, despite them being different colors. To briefly explain some other interesting applications, we can use this similarity overlays technique to compare the representation across different layers. In this example, we compare against different mixed four layers in Googlenet. One phenomenon we notice is that the representation is spatially smoother at later layers. This is likely because early layers tend to capture lower level features such as textures, whereas later layers tend to capture things like semantic parts, such as the dog nose or the dog eye. Another way we can use our visualization is in combination with other visualization techniques. In this example, we examine a generated image that is constrained to look like modern art and pair it with a few other examples of the same object. Um, this generated image was generated to be classified as a blow dryer. As we hover over the image, we notice that it shares some of the same representation as normal blow dryers. For instance, as I move up and down and side to side on this blow dryer, we notice the same patterns reflected in other examples. Something else we're able to discover is we're able to understand 
what the more abstract qualities of this generated image connotes. For instance, as we hover over this black line, we notice that it seems to highlight the other chords. By generating this visualization of uh, different factors, uh, which we use, which we generate using non-negative matrix factorization, we're also suggested different areas that we can explore. For instance, it highlights the chords as a separate component. It also seems to highlight exploring the top of a blow dryer compared to the bottom stem. Another example of us combining visualizations is this one. Right here, we explore the, the sensitivity or invariance a model is to geometric transformations left rotation. In this example, we couple our similarity overlays with an interactive chart, which plots uh, the corresponding patches and how similar the current patch in yellow is to those patches. Concretely, as I hover over the dog nose in this image, the line chart shows me the similarity of this patch to the other dog nose patches in the other rotated images. As we explore in this example, we find pretty quickly some interesting things such as border artifacts as shown in the ripple of the line plot. Unlike our prior work, net to vec where we study channels, in this work, we study how activations correspond to different spatial locations. Every spatial location is an activation vector where each dimension corresponds to a channel. Similar to how we compute similarities between constant vectors in our net vec work, we visualize the similarity or distances between activations at different spatial locations. This is represented by the theta. Finally, I'll give a brief teaser for some current and future work on improving the interpretability of deep neural networks. If artificial intelligence better simulated human intelligence in its decision-making process, we might feel more comfortable trusting AI systems, even if we don't fully understand them. For instance, most individuals can trust another human being without a full understanding of how their brain works, if they've observed them for a while and behave in a similar way to what we've seen in trusted friends and family. In this work, we demonstrate how to align machine decisions with human decisions. In machine learning, typically every example is weighted equally. However, this isn't true for humans. There's typically some canonical examples and some outlier examples. Here, we learn to weight examples as humans would weight them. Specifically, we extract these human weightings from fMRI recordings of human brain activity as a subject is viewing different kinds of images. To our knowledge, is the, this is the first work of this kind. Um, furthermore, we don't need to fully understand how the human brain works in order to leverage the benefits of using it to condition our model. Thus, in, our, in this work, our model learns to weight examples in a more human aligned way, and that we demonstrate that this paradigm yields stronger performance. Now to talk about some future work. For most of this talk, I've highlighted our work on understanding model behavior. The tools I've introduced can allow us to identify systematic mistakes made by a network. These insights can then be used to fix networks themselves. Consider this doctor example again. Suppose our attribution method highlights that this model relies on spurious cues encoded in the face, such as gender or race, to make its prediction. We could then retrain the network to base its decision on other input features and check that it indeed relies on what we consider the causal cue, in this case, the stethoscope. We can also correct the internal representation of a network to either not rely on the male concept for its prediction or by debiasing the doctor concept with respect to gender, such that the distances from the male and female concept are the same. Related work like this has been done for word embeddings in natural language. Thus, over the past few years and in this talk, I've investigated three different research themes on understanding deep neural networks. First is concerned with what a model is looking at. The second begs the question of what and how does a model encode information? The last one is probably the most exciting one. 
a number of people in this community have uh, been increasingly more excited about, and that is how can we improve models to be more robust, interpretable, and aligned to human representation? This is somewhat analogous to work done in the medical field. Most of the work I've presented so far has really been focused on diagnosing problems, but we don't really just want diagnosis, we want treatments. And that's what I hope uh, the future of this research field direction moves in. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge um, my funders, the Rhodes Trust and the Open Philanthropy Project, as well as the collaborators on the projects mentioned in this talk. Andrea Vidaldi, Mandela Patrick, uh, Chris Ola, Alexander Mord Mordvintsev, Walter Scharr, and David Cox. This work would not have been able to be possible without their support. Thank you. Uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach me um, by email.